encourage you to take your Bibles. Turn to James chapter 3. Emma is going to come and read our passage to us. If you're able and willing, would you just stand as Emma comes to read for us? James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. All right, James 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it is self set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. It is restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives and grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. We continue to work our way through this letter uh, to James, written by James to churches all over the world, uh, the known world, uh, the Roman Empire at the time he wrote it, to believers and uh, we've been in this for a while, and we still got a little ways to go yet, but the title of our series is James, How Faith Affects Life. I've mentioned many times, almost every Sunday, that I've been preaching on James. I love the book of James. It's very practical. Uh, it's got wonderful, practical, spiritual advice about almost every area, a uh, major area of life, and how our faith should affect those areas of life. And I hope that you've been uh, studying it on your own, too, and I would encourage you to do that. The title of my message today is Watch Your Mouth. How many of you had somebody ever tell you that? Maybe when you were a lot younger. Yeah, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. As Emma just read that passage, you can tell James is going to talk to us today about the words that come out of our mouth. And that's a very practical thing because as far as I know, every single one of us talk. I don't see anybody in here that I've never heard talk. So it applies to all of us. Makes me think of a story that I heard a number of years ago about a man who worked in a grocery store and he was in the produce department. And one day he's in the produce department, and he's setting out the produce and that kind of stuff. And this 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 little little older lady comes walking up to him and said, "Excuse me, young man, I have a request to make." He says, "Well, what can I do to help you?" You know, very good customer service. She says, "I would like to buy a half a head of lettuce." He says, "A half." Let me know, you want to buy a half a head of lettuce? She says, yes, I want to buy a half a head of lettuce. He says, well, they grow as whole. That's the way God made them. That's the way they're wrapped. That's the way we, we sell them. We, we've never sold a half a head of lettuce. And she goes, but I'm, but I'm all by myself, and I can't eat the whole head before it goes back. I just want a half a head of lettuce. Please, could you sell me a half a head of lettuce? He's so frustrated. He says, you know what? Wait here. I'm going to go talk to the manager. So he, he marches up to the front of the store, and he's just getting really irritated because it's not that expensive. She can just buy a whole head of And he doesn't know this, but she's following him. You know, he asked her to stay. So he's going up there, and he sees the manager, and he watches. Listen, I, I got to talk to you. There is this lame brain idiot of a woman in the back of the store who wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And the manager is listening to this, and he sees this woman behind him, and her, this woman's getting this look on her face like, oh, my goodness. And he's like, and so the man's finishing up his comments. He says, this idiot, lame brain uh, woman in the back of the store who wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And he turns around because the man's, and he says, and this wonderful woman wants to buy the other half. <laughs> now, I don't tell that story to justify lying or conniving to try to get yourself out of trouble, although we probably are all guilty of doing that. Sometimes, But just to illustrate, like we need an illustration of how often and how easy it is for our mouths to get us into trouble. And we need to watch our mouths. 
And we've mentioned in some previous messages that this is a theme that's important to James. And he's already mentioned it twice. And you can go back. There's two other messages. I think it was the fifth message and the sixth message uh, in this series um, where he at least spends part of the time talking about our mouths. In James 1.19, uh, he says, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak. And slow to anger and we spend a little bit of time in that message as part of it You know we talk about be a really good listener and be very careful when you do speak how you speak and what you say That kind of thing so you could go back and re-listen to that or listen to it for the first time Then in James 1 and 26 he's already given us a warning that he's going to really expand on in this passage He said if anyone thinks he's religious and the idea here is if you think you've got a relationship with God and things are good between you and God and, and, you know, spiritually speaking, you're doing all right. He says, if anybody thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. That's a pretty strong statement. And he's going to say some other strong statements in this passage we're looking at today in James chapter 3. So as I said, we're going to work our way through uh, James chapter 3 verses 1 to 12. And we're going to talk about four truths that this passage tells us about our words. And then what can we do about it? That's the real important part. What can we do about it? Because this is an issue we all have to deal with. The first truth that I see here in this passage is that our words are important. Our words are important. Now, I know you probably already realize that. But the thing that I'm praying and I I'm hoping that will happen today is that we realize how important they are because I think we realize that at least some of our words are important and we got to be really careful under certain circumstances but it becomes all too easy to think that the rest of the time it's not that big a deal you know because of my temperament because of my personality because of the way I was raised because it just feel, feels so good to get it off my chest because they really need to know this anyway that sometimes we can say what we want and let the chips fall where they may and can I tell you that there is a time and place for that but probably not as often as we think there is so we need emphasize to us today, and James is doing this all through the passage, but right here in the first two verses, especially saying words, our words are tremendously important. And we could make a long list why that's true, but there's two things that he focuses on here, okay? The first one is this, is because they can lead people toward or away from truth. The words we speak can lead people toward or away from truth. In verse 1, he says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. It seems like James, as he's writing this letter, gets this idea. He needs to give this warning to teachers, and he's getting ready to kind of expound on that. And so he starts out in verse 1 talking to teachers, but then all of a sudden he shifts gear to talk about everybody. So if you're sitting here saying, well, I'm not a teacher, this doesn't apply to me. Well, part of this may not apply to you specifically in as much detail, but the whole rest of it will. So don't turn it off, okay? But he says, don't many of you, not many of you should become teachers. Now, he's not trying to discourage people from becoming teachers. Teachers, and this is talking about teachers in the church, but a lot of what I'm getting ready to tell you is true of any kind of teachers in any setting, especially in the school system. But in the church, James is talking specifically that teachers and the, the gift of teaching and the responsibility of teaching was tremendously important. And it still is. Because we need to communicate truth to people that don't know the truth. And we need truth communicated to us in the areas that we don't know the truth. Nobody knows everything that we need to know. Nobody knows everything that it would be beneficial for us to know in any area, much less spiritual things. And so the teachers had a very, very important role and still do in the church. Right up there with the pastors and the apostles and the prophets, as the New Testament calls those specific offices and what we would call missionaries. In fact, there's a lot of warnings in the New Testament against false teachers, which illustrates the point that James is trying to make here, that people who speak in the form of teaching can lead people toward or away from truth. Now, if you believe a lie about something that's not that significant, the consequences may not be that big of a deal. But if you believe a lie about eternal realities... That can be very, 
very dangerous. And so what James is saying when he says not many of you should become teachers, he's not trying to discourage people who God had called to be teachers and had gifted to be teachers, but because this was such an important responsibility, and to be honest, in human nature, because it's a position or a ministry where people up in front of people, you know, people would often look up to teachers, and it'd be very easy to become proud of being a teacher and to enjoy all the attention and all that kind of stuff. It is a well-respected position, so it'd be very easy for someone who perhaps God hadn't called to be a teacher or hadn't gifted to be a teacher, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a teacher. I want to be one of those people that stands up in front of people and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so he says, listen, I, I think what James is saying here is, listen, make sure that you're supposed to be a teacher before you pursue that, okay? It was a great responsibility. And, and what he says here, the reason why, or one of the reasons why, is because teachers are going to be held to a higher standard of judgment, now, that doesn't mean that teachers will be judged more strictly than lay people as far as their spiritual walk or whatever. It just says we are all going to be responsible for whatever God has gifted us with and how we use that and what the end results are. And for teachers, that can be very powerful. And what he's saying is if you're not careful and you lead people astray, you're going to be held accountable for that. And we talk about eternity for people, unfortunately, who did this in the days of the early church and through all history and even today, people who deliberately teach false truths and lead people astray to where people are going to miss out on salvation and miss out on eternity with God, they are going to be held very, very accountable. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders, this is talking about spiritual leaders, and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. It's not talking about teachers specifically, but talking about all spiritual leaders. It says, listen, you need to cooperate with your spiritual leaders. Now, let's talk about when they're doing the right thing and all that kind of stuff, because they have a big, important responsibility. God has given them care over you to lead you the right direction, to tell you the right things, to help you grow in the Lord, and just, just makes the job a whole lot easier if you'd cooperate. I just want to tell you that as a pastor, I take this so very seriously, both in the sense of general care as a pastor, but in the area of teaching and preaching. My greatest burden, I'll just say one of my greatest burdens and passions as a person, as a Christian, is I want to know God's Word. I want to know what it means in context. I want to know how it applied back then, and I want to know how it applies today, and I want to live it out, and it's my great joy to be able to share that with other people. That's, that's just my passion. That's why I'm a pastor. That's why I love to preach and teach, okay? But along with that, I'm very, very concerned that whatever I share would be right and would be true. And that's why I, I challenge you, just as Paul challenged that you take what I say and you examine it and compare it to God's word. And if you think that somehow I'm saying something that's not quite right with God's word, come talk to me about it because either I am wrong and I want to know because I want to get it right, or I've not communicated right or I've not communicated well or you're misunderstanding something or you don't know the whole picture and I want to have the opportunity to give you the whole picture so you can understand it. I, th I, can, I, can honestly, I, I can honestly say that I'm sure through the years I've said some things that were not spot on exactly right. But I can also honestly say that I have never deliberately misled anybody in what God's word says and what it means and how it applies. And that's, that's my heart. Now, that's what he says about teachers. But before we go on, I just want to tell you something. That even though he's talking specifically to teachers, it still has an application to every single one of us. Because even if you're not a teacher, this, that specific thing he's talking about here, your words influence other people, okay? Even if it's just a family member, even if it's a friend, a coworker, somebody else at school, your words influence them. And even though James is giving this warning to teachings, there's, there's still that aspect of a warning that you want to be very careful that whatever you share, whatever you tell, whatever information you pass along to other people does not lead them astray because you will be held accountable for what you've shared. So our words are important because they can lead people toward or away from truth. A second reason that he talks about here is that they are a measure of our spirituality. Think about that. Your words, the things that come out of your mouth, tells the world to some degree how spiritually mature you are. 
That's pretty sobering. Especially for those of us, perhaps, that struggle with the things that we say. For those of us that have a habit of just kind of letting it loose when it comes up. You look at verse 2, he says, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. What He says, you know, we all stumble. James is including himself. He says, listen, we're all part of the human race. We all blow it. We all make innocent mistakes. We all make deliberate mistakes. We all do things that displease God by accident. And to be honest, we all do things that displease God on purpose. And he's talked about it before. He'll talk about it again in his letter that we need to deal with those things before God. But he says, especially in our words. And he says, our words have such great significance. He says, if a man is, does not stumble in what he says, or if somebody could, he basically says, nobody's ever done it, nobody ever will. But if you could find someone who never messed up and what they said, they must be a perfect man. Does he mean by that that if you could just get your words exactly right, it wouldn't matter what else you do? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you know, it's hard to live your life the right way in every area of life, but one of the hardest is our words. If you can control your tongue, you've probably got the strength you need to control the other areas of your life too. And he says, when, it, when he says that person is perfect, that word means mature or complete. And the idea he's getting here, because he's, he already says we all stumble, we all mess up. But if somebody could get it right, they'd probably be able to get it right in every area. He's saying our words demonstrate our level of spiritual maturity. So as we're going through this, and you're kind of looking at your own life, I'm looking at my own life. You think about the words that come out of your mouth under any and every situation, relationships, wherever you might be, home, at work, whatever, realize that if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm not saying you're not, that one of the primary things that illustrates how mature you are, and, and we're all in process, okay? I mean, if you've recently become a Christian and you've had a real problem with your mouth before you were a Christian, it's, it may take you a while. To grow and learn, but you should be growing and learning and, and becoming more mature, which means it's going to affect your speech, okay? It's going to change. There are going to be some things that you used to say that you're not going to say anymore, and you're going to work real hard to make sure that doesn't come out, and not just what you say, but how you say it, and, and all that kind of thing, because he says that that's a sign. That, that, that's a measure of your spiritual maturity, but why is that so? The reason that's so is because our words reveal what's in our hearts and in our minds too okay but the word heart is used most often in fact this passage i'm going to read now uh, jesus said in luke 6 43 to 45 he mentions the heart but in, in their concept the idea of the heart was the whole inner being it included not only our emotions but our will and our minds and all that kind of stuff but jesus said in luke 6 43 to 45 he says for no good tree bears bad fruit nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So you see, whatever comes out of your mouth is evidence of at least something that's in your heart. And as we're growing, as we're trying to walk with God, uh, and none of us are perfect. I'm not perfect yet. It's a constant process. But the longer we're walking with the Lord, the more our hearts should be changing, and therefore the more our mouths should be changing. And that's why James says the words that come out of our mouth are a measure of our spiritual maturity. So our words are important. There's actually another reason why our words are important. It's because our words are powerful, but that's actually the next point. You see, James decides to, to drill down and to really focus on this next thing. Our words are powerful. Now, I don't, I don't need to tell you that. But once again, it's a truth we know, but I think sometimes we excuse ourselves. We say, well, it's not that big a deal. We need to be reminded again, and James does exactly that, that our words are powerful. Now, they can be powerful for good, and we're going to talk more about that at the end of the message today. But what James is focusing on, because he's trying to warn them, and he's trying to warn us that this is a serious issue, 
that our words can be tremendously powerful in a negative way. He uses several word pictures here to describe the nature and the effect of the tongue. He, his idea is the tongue is really, really small, but it is very powerful. It's very influential. Look at verse 3. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. T two things. He, he, he says a bit in a bridle that you put in a horse. How many of you have ever gone horseback riding? All right. I've gone horseback riding, and not any time recently, but a number of times in my life. You know, a lot of people go horseback riding in one of those places where you go and you pay a certain amount of money, and you climb on the back of the horse, and you're not really horse. Well, you are horseback riding, but basically your horse is just following the horse in front of them. Ah, to me, that's no fun. Well, that's kind of fun, ride a horse through the woods or whatever. But I remember when we lived in Arizona, I uh, had some friends in our church who had friends that had a ranch and some horses. And, and one of the best memories of a fun day that I have from when we pastored in Arizona was a day that I went out with a couple of guys in my church. And we went out to this ranch, and we each, well, I didn't saddle up a horse. I didn't know how to do that. Somebody else did it for me. But we spent the whole day just out there in the Arizona uh, Arizona desert and high mountains and all that kind of stuff just just riding horses all day long and there are times we just ride along creek beds and going down through and galloping across flat stretches jumping over it was a blast you know a whole lot more fun than just sitting on a horse that's following the one in front of them but whichever way it is that horse is that horse is a big animal weighs a whole lot more than we do has a lot more strength than we do, is more powerful, can go a lot faster, but it's all controlled by this little piece of metal on the bridle in their mouth. So you've got this humongous, powerful animal that can be controlled by just this little teeny tiny piece of metal. And the second picture he gives is a, a big ship that's controlled by a small rudder. You know, I don't know if you know how that works. You know, whatever size ship you have, it can be steered and put a different direction just because of a little tiny piece of wood or metal that the rudder is made out of, and it just moves a little bit as you're going through the water. You know, you've all, you've all either been on a cruise ship or you've seen cruise ships or whatever, but I thought it'd be interesting to see how big a rudder is for a cruise ship. So I looked it up actually this morning, and, and I, I did a search for rudders on cruise ships, Okay. Not real spiritual, but I just did this. But you all know how big cruise ships are. I mean, they're all different sizes, but I mean, enough that five, six, seven thousand people can live on this thing, plus have a lot of fun and eat, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the rudder, compared to that size, what I saw was about the size of a two-story house. Now, that's, that's pretty big. But compared to the ship, it's tiny. Now, you get into a much smaller ship, you can have this big ship, boat, whatever you want to call it, controlled by just a little tiny thing. If you ever go on canoe, and I've done that many times, you know, you, you go along, you got this canoe, you can get two, three people in it, you're going along good, and you can steer that thing just by putting your oar in there and just twisting it a little bit. A little tiny thing controls such a big thing and in such a powerful way. And his idea here is that the tongue is small, but it's an effective controller of powerful forces. And, and, and to, to add to that, it's not just that it's, it controls powerful things and has great power, but that that power is exerted in such a way that it determines our direction and our destiny. So our tongues are very, very powerful. You know, we see this in a negative way throughout history. Someone like a man like Hitler. How did Hitler come to power? Hitler was not a very big guy. He wasn't a very muscular guy from the pictures I've seen. You know, but yet he controlled so many people and led this world into a tremendous world war. And they say it's because he was such a powerful speaker. He could stir people's emotions. He could bring people to a place of commitment and a willingness to sacrifice for the cause. Saddam Hussein, I've heard, is the same way. Lots of people through history... You know, there's a simple statement we've heard before, maybe we've said before, that illustrates this because it's one of the biggest lies that's put out there, and you all know it. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's one of the biggest lies out there. Words are powerful. They can hurt you a whole lot more than sticks and stones, and for a lot longer. 
So our words are powerful, and that leads to the next point here. Our words are dangerous. Our words are dangerous, or they can be. They can be dangerous for good, too. That's what our goal should be. If we look here at verse 5, I only read the first half of it. Uh, a minute ago so also the tongue is a small member yet it boasts of great things the second part says how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire our words are dangerous because they are often destructive they are often destructive he uses uh, the, the, the idea of a fire now this is something if you keep up with the news you know we see this all the time I know the end of last year and into the beginning of this year, all over the news were these tremendous fires that had broken out in Australia and great big areas of Australia were ablaze and there was very little they could do about it. And then we know that, uh, or if you watch the news now, you can, I, I just saw yesterday, um, it just popped up on what I was looking at yesterday, but it's been a couple of months now that there's an area in Argentina where because of a drought, the rivers have dried up, and there's a great big area down in Argentina that is now ablaze. They can't control it. I mean, we're talking miles and mi square, miles and miles, square miles of land that is just fires are sweeping through. And then as my wife prayed about it this morning, if you look at the news that just Friday, a fire broke out, Southern California. They don't know yet how it started but it's out of control. They say there are hundreds of firefighters on the scene trying to control it. And as of this morning, it said it was 0% controlled. They're saying that all the efforts they've made so far has not done anything to control it. Now, hopefully that'll change. We definitely prayed about that. We will continue to do so. But fire is so destructive, and he compares our tongues to a fire. A fire that is out of control has this wide-ranging impact. It spreads. It multiplies quickly. One moment can destroy what it took years to build, and you can never fully reverse the damage. You can go back in. You can clear. You can rebuild, but the damage is still there, and he says that's the way our words are. And I wish it wasn't so. I hope it's not so for very many people. But there are people in this room that you've experienced this in, your relation, in some relationships. Uh, we probably all have to some degree, but I mean some to where it's been really bad. Words kill. Words damage. Words destroy relationships, marriages. There's a number of things we can do to save and keep and help our marriages be strong. And one of the main ones is how we use our words. It can be a powerful force for good. But it's also one of the most powerful forces for destruction in a marriage. But not just marriages. Parents and their children. Other relationships in the family. In the church. You, you say words. You can't erase them. You can't take them back. You can apologize. You can try to work things out and heal. But, but once they're out, they're there. They're there. Now, fire also has its positive uses. You know, to warm, to cook. As I said, you know, just because it, it can be destructive doesn't mean it have, a, have its positive side. It's just like words. And again, we'll come back to that before we get done today. So our words are dangerous because they're often destructive, but also because they often lead to evil because they're inspired by evil. Not all of our words are inspired by evil, but James makes it very clear that when you are spewing this stuff that's ungodly and, and, and wrong and destructive, it's not just your human nature coming out. You are being influenced and giving into powers that are inspired by hell itself. You look at verse 6 and verse 8. He says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Verse 8, it says, But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. He says, All the negative things that come out of our mouths has as its ultimate root hell. Satanic, spiritual, deep, evil forces. Now, I'm not trying to say that every time you say something, you shouldn't say that you're demon-possessed. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, there's a source for that kind of thing. And it's not a source you want to be tapping into. Another reason our words are dangerous is because they are often untamable. He talks about this in verses 7 and 8. In fact, he just says that. Verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame 
the tongue. It is often untamable. The illustration he gives, he says, you know what? It doesn't matter how wild an animal is. Somewhere, sometimes, someone has tamed that animal. And we've probably all seen that. You go to a show at a zoo or an amusement park or, or, or um, you know, someplace like that or a circus, and you see people that have tamed elephants and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Anyway, cultural illusion there. Uh, you know, they train all kinds of stuff. I, I saw a thing on, on social media this last week. It, it was, it's like, I would, I, this lady's crazy. This lady feeding one of the largest alligators they have in, in, in captivity, and she's down in the water with the food in her hand, and the alligator's coming up. It's like, uh-uh, not me. Too many cases of animals that have been, quote, tamed that then turn and get back to their original nature. I would not want to try that. But he says, you know what? Human beings can, can tame animals, but we struggle to tame our tongue. You know, I, I mentioned the title of the message today, Watch Your Mouth. Another statement perhaps you've heard, obviously not told to you, but maybe to somebody else, hold your tongue. Hold your tongue. Have you ever actually tried to do that? Yeah, I have too, because I wanted to try it as an experiment. You know, I challenge you, you know, you don't have to do it right now. Can't do it with wearing a mask anyway. Go home and try to hold your tongue. I mean, literally, just grip, grip a hold of your tongue, and with everything you have in your hand, try to hold it still, but, it's, you know, you got to have kind of a little bit of a split personality to do this, but, but, you know, but also try to move your tongue. Can I tell you, I think your tongue's going to win every time. I mean, unless you use a pair of pliers or something, you know, you are not going to be able to hold your tongue. It's just too slippery. It's just too whatever. It can escape from your hold. That picture is just there. It just shows how difficult it is to control our tongues. And that's the point that James is trying to make here. Our words are dangerous because our tongue is so untamable. Now, now when he says this here, it can be almost, it can be very discouraging. He says, no human being can tame the tongue. You say, well, you know what? If that's true, then why should I try? Why shouldn't I just let loose? Why shouldn't I just say whatever comes to mind? Why, why, you know, why even try? If it cannot be tamed, why bother trying? Well, first of all, he says, no human being. Can I tell you that when we have God's presence and power in our life, he can help us to control anything. And that's part of what James is trying to point out here. But you know what? Even apart from that, just because our tongues may never be totally tameable doesn't mean we shouldn't try. That'd be sort of like saying, you know, those wildfires have broken out in Southern California or Australia or Argentina, wherever you want. But you know what? We can't really do a whole lot about it right now, so let's not even try. No, there are hundreds and hundreds of firefighters using all kinds of equipment from helicopters and whatever, trying to contain that, trying to get it under control, to minimize the damage, to stop it. And that's the same attitude we need to have about our words and about our tongues. Yes, it's hard to tame. Yes, it gets away from me sometimes, but I've got to do what I can, and especially those of us that are believers, with the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to get a hold of this thing. I may still slip up and make a mess of it sometimes. But by God's grace, may that be less and less and less and less. Our words are dangerous. And the fourth truth here, our words are hypocritical. Our words are hypocritical. Another word is inconsistent. Verses 9 to 12. He says, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. Think about this. This is one of the best, if not the absolute best thing you can do with your tongue. In the sense of speaking something. I mean, eating is pretty good too, but we're not talking about that. Is we can praise God. We can bless God. We can honor God and extol the worth and power and majesty of the God who is the creator of the universe. The creator of us who is willing to allow us to call him father. To have a relationship with him. And we can bless him and we can worship him. And he says, our tongues do that. But he didn't stop there. And he says, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. He says, we bless God and we curse people. But he very deliberately did not stop there because he say, well, people are not God. You know, I mean, blessing God and worshiping God and giving God glory is one thing. But people are people. 
But James points out something very, very important here. He says, he's referring to all the teaching of Scripture, and that is that every single human being is uniquely created and loved by God. And some of you need to hear that for yourself today. You are uniquely created and loved by God. But what most of us need to hear today is that is true of the person that we most disagree with. That is true also of the person that we most struggle with. That is true also of the person that it's like, oh, I wish they they had no part of my life. That's true of the person that we might be tempted to and perhaps even give into temptation to curse, to wish bad on. And that's what he means by curse. He doesn't mean you just cuss them out. That would be part of it. But to curse someone means to wish bad on them, to to wish that they would be condemned. In In a spiritual sense, to wish that they would be condemned to hell. He says, out of the same mouth comes both those things. It shouldn't be that way. And he gives some, some natural examples here, you know, and, and you can tell he's been influenced by his brother Jesus. James is Jesus' half-brother, you know, because the passage I read about from Jesus a minute ago, he used the illustration of figs and thorn bushes, and, you know, it, uh, the, the plant produces what it's, supposed to plant, uh, what it's supposed to produce. He says, you know, a spring doesn't have both fresh water and salt water come out of it. A fig tree doesn't bear olives or a grapevine figs or a salt pond have fresh water. He says, if something is what it is, that's what it's going to produce. And and so what he's trying to tell us here and what's made very clear here is that we produce according to our nature. A fig tree is going to produce figs because that's its nature. A freshwater spring is going to produce fresh water because that's its nature. And he says in the same way, if we're children of God, we should be producing good words because that should be our nature. Now, we're unique in one sense, and James doesn't dig into this, okay? A fig tree is a fig tree, but a human being has a sinful, fallen human nature. But if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, God's Spirit dwells within us. And in Galatians, Paul talks, and in Romans too, Paul talks about the struggle that there is between the Spirit of God within us and our sinful, fallen nature. And that kind of explains why it is that sometimes we see this hypocritical nature of our tongue, that we say good things and we say bad things, doesn't excuse it. But it's inside, it's our fallen nature that is trying to take control of, In the spirit of God that's saying you can have control over this. And sometimes we pursue God and his power and he gives us victory because he's always willing to give us victory. Sometimes we give into our sinful human nature and we let loose things we shouldn't let loose of. And what James says here, he says, my brothers, this should not be. These things shouldn't be. We've experienced that. I tell you, the area I experience it most is when I'm driving down the road. I, I've shared before, it's been a long while, that one of my biggest pet peeves is somebody that cuts me off in traffic or, or someone who just, you know, you know, you got this long line to get off because there's an accident and somebody decides, well, I'm the exception to every rule. I'm going to drive along the side of the road and get ahead of everybody. You know, I'm, that kind of stuff just really, it's the area I have to pray most about and that kind of thing. So, but, you know, driving along, you know, and you got a really good station on, some really good Christian music, some worship, and you're just praising God and all, and somebody cuts you off and says, you idiot! You know, I've been guilty of saying that. Shock, shock. I will say that's about the worst I've ever said. <laughs> Not bragging, I'm just saying. <laughs> Doesn't make it right. But you know what? We can be praising God one minute and somebody really tick us off with something, you know, and it may not be somebody on the road. It may be somebody in our family. It may be somebody at work, somebody at school. And before you know it, even if you're not saying it, you're thinking it, that it just flips so quick. And and we got to work on that. But I don't feel as bad, not to excuse it, but look at the Apostle Peter. You know, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be arrested, and all this stuff's going to happen. And Peter says, listen. And he says, he says, you're all going to run away. You're all going to deny me. You're all going to run away. You're all going to abandon me. And Peter says, I will never abandon you. Okay? I mean, even if I've got to die with you, I will never abandon you. And they're in the garden. Jesus is praying. He's done praying. The guards come to arrest him. And Peter does stand up for Jesus. He takes a sword. He takes a swing. And he totally misses the guy and cuts his ear off. Jesus says, no, no, no. That's not the way this is going. He heals the guy's ear. And then Peter runs away with all the rest of them. 
Now, I have to say this about Peter. He begins to feel guilty, so he begins to follow them, and he ends up in the courtyard of the high priest in his home where um, Jesus is being uh, questioned. But as Peter is being questioned by a serving girl, aren't you one of this guy's followers? I think you're, no, 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 no. And he denies him three times, and it says the third time he begins to call down curses on himself, which doesn't mean he begins to curse like we think of cursing. It means he says, may I be forever condemned if I know this guy. I mean, we're talking serious stuff here. Even Peter coming out both, you know, that's, where, that's why you get that same, he comes out of both sides, and speaks out of both sides of their mouth. Peter had to deal with that too. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we can be so guilty of that. We can look and sound so good at church and be a mess at home to our families. Or look and sound real good at home and at church, but be a horrible person to work with or work for in the workplace. I mean, whatever your different venues are, school, work, home, whatever it might be, you know, if, if we try to divide it up and boy I got to be real holy and righteous and my words and everything in one place but I can kind of let down everywhere else there's a problem there there's a problem there and, and I'm just going to venture out on a limb here I just feel like I should right now is a very very important time for this for those of us who are actively well I shouldn't say us because I'm not in social media, but for those who are really active on social media, but it's not just social media, discussions, whatever, whether it's about the coronavirus and all the different facts and figures and theories and stuff that has to do with that, or if it has to do with politics and all the things that we're going to be going through the next couple of months in the process of electing leaders and selecting things and voting on issues. We need to be very careful about what we say and how we say it. It just, it just grieves my heart when I see things, usually on social media, that are said by people about people who disagree with them. Whether, again, it's about the coronavirus and everything it's been doing, you know, or whether it's about a political issue or a political candidate or a leader or whatever, or even the statements are made by a leader. But the name calling, the 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 arrogant, and it's all over the place. I mean, I'm not pointing out a particular person. I'm just, it's on both sides. I'm just saying, can I just encourage all of us as believers in Jesus Christ, engage in your discussions, get involved in posting things on social media if that's what you want to do, but be careful what you say and how you say it. Let's remember that we represent Jesus Christ before we represent any particular viewpoint or any particular political party or any particular any other group you want to name. And how we represent Jesus is much more important than what we would say or how we would say it about any of these other issues. Well, I'll leave that one alone and some of you are saying, thank you, Jesus. So we have a big problem. We have a big problem. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 to 27, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you'll be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. That doesn't mean that it's going to, you know, whether you get into heaven or not, it's going to be determined by how you spoke. The Bible is very clear. The only way we're getting into heaven is if we're trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we're depending upon his death on the cross to have paid the price for our sins because we don't deserve it and we can't earn it. But the Bible makes it very clear that we will be held accountable for our words. We're also going to be held accountable for our actions. We're going to be held accountable for whatever God entrusted to us and how do we use that for him in this life. But right here, Jesus said, your words is going to be one of those things that is going to be examined. And you know, there's a lot of topics and each one could be a separate sermon. But the Bible talks about our areas that we have to be very careful about. Areas that are specifically sin or areas where you got to be very careful how you deal with it because it could be sin, it may not. But the Bible talks about things like gossip. Can I tell you that gossip doesn't always just mean lies. Gossip can be stuff that's passed around that's true. 
but it's not passed around the way it should be, or maybe it shouldn't be passed around at all, even though it's true, or in the way that it is, or the way that it's been said, and it, it's not kind, complaining. I'm not saying there's not a time and place. There certainly is to, if you see something that's not right, to register that, quote, complaint, to discuss it, to see how it can be. But the idea of complaining, we see it in the Old Testament with God's people going through the wilderness. God is taking care of them, and they're just constantly complaining about what God's doing. Complaining, murmuring, cursing, vulgar language, using God's name in vain. I just want to pause on this. This is so prevalent in our culture. And it is so prevalent in our culture that I hear a lot of Christians say things. It's like, man, in my opinion, that comes really close to taking God's name in vain. And I know the person doesn't want to, doesn't mean to. They're just saying something kind of in passing, kind of flippantly. Can I tell you what I use as a rule in my life that I think is very, very helpful? And if this helps you, then you use it. What I would recommend, and I've done this for years, is never speak the name of God unless you're talking to him or about him so that includes worship that includes prayer but if we could discipline ourselves to never say the name of God unless we're speaking to him or about him we would not take his name in vain I'll be honest with you in our culture OMG that's one of the Everybody just says it, posts it, whatever. Can I tell you, if you say that or post that flippantly, that's taking God's name in vain. It means you're treating God because his name represents who he is lightly. That may hit home hard uh, for some of us, but I'm just saying it's a serious thing. Taking God's name in vain. False teaching, lying, manipulation, tearing other people down in any verbal way, including verbal abuse, slander, belittling, calling names. I quoted earlier James 1.26. James says, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious is, religion is worthless. So what do we do about it? I, I find it kind of interesting that James just stops. And he goes on to a new topic that's related, and we're going to deal with that next week, God willing. But he doesn't really give any advice. He just says, this is a real problem. It shouldn't be this way. Watch out. So I want to give you some advice very, very quickly, because we need to round, right, round And all this advice is based on God's word. And as we're going to go through it really, really quickly, if you are taking notes, you just do it the best you can. But you might just want to take a picture of the screen at the very end, because it'll all be on the screen at the same time. Real quick, number one, recognize the real problem is the heart. I already read from Luke 6, 43 to 45. Jesus said, it's out of the heart the mouth speaks. So if you want to see your mouth change, you need a change of heart. At its most basic um, foundation, you need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, you can try real hard to clean up what comes out of your mouth, and you may make some success. But can I tell you that the Bible says that when we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become a new creation. His Spirit comes to dwell within us, and God begins to work on us from the inside out. If you do know Jesus, as I said earlier, we're, we're growing, we're maturing. We're not, none of us are perfect yet. I still say things I shouldn't say. But we need a heart change. And I'm praying, God, change my heart. Help my heart to be more like yours in every area. Recognize the real problem is the heart. Second one, repent when you mess up. We've got God's promise. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that includes our words. Sometimes we don't want to. Well, I said it, I stand by it. Felt good to get it off my chest. I know it hurt, but it needed to be said. There's a lot of different ways to say things that need to be said. If we believe we've said it the wrong way, according to God's standards, we need to fess up. We need to ask God to forgive us. You know, the longer we cling to our right to say what we want, the longer it'll take to get this mess cleaned up. It's a whole other issue, and I'll just mention this, that we, we also have to ask the people we've hurt to forgive us too. The third thing is this, pray for God's help. God is willing to help us in every area of life. Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. There's a lot of different things in the Psalms, Proverbs, that you can pray. Lord, help me with my mouth, but, but pray, God, help me. Fourth one, depend on the Holy Spirit's assistance. You know, I said James 1.8 says, no human being can tame the tongue. We can't do it without God's help, but with God's help, we can. 
And there's so much about the Holy Spirit and his work. In Galatians, it says if you walk in the Spirit, you know, you live under the power and the authority and cooperation with the power of the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But especially Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, it says the fruit of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit's active in your work, in your life, this is the kind of stuff it'll start producing. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many of you know if those nine things are growing in your life, it's going to affect what you say and how you say it? So pray, God, fill me with your Spirit. Holy Spirit, I want to cooperate with you to see all of these fruits developed and matured, and may it affect my words. So depend on the Holy Spirit's assistant. The fifth one, think before you speak. Think before you speak. Don't say the first thing that comes to mind. James 1.19, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Go back and listen to that message where I preached about that. We spent a lot of time on that. Number six, there's only seven. Number six, exercise self-control. What that means is we've got to do our part. We can pray, God, help me. And Lord, I'm depending on your Holy Spirit. But we expect that because we pray that, he's going to force us to say the right things. And he's going to lock our lips shut when we're about ready to say the wrong things. We're wrong. We still have full control of our bodies and of our lips and our tongue. So we've got to do our part. We need to exercise self-control. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Ephesians 4, 29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And uh, I'm not going to read the rest of them, but be sure to check out Colossians 4, 6, Ephesians 5, 3 to 4. And I want to challenge you, if God really lays this on your heart, and even if he doesn't, it'd be a good thing to do. Do a study of the book of Proverbs. Look specifically for what it says about our words and our mouth and then work on applying it the last one number seven i told you we're going to get back to this use your mouth for good you know just like any other area of our life when we're struggling with something bad the more we can put that to use for good the more it'll help us with the bad if you really struggle with your words with your tongue with your mouth whether it's in general with anybody and everybody or a specific person focus real hard on doing just the opposite and with god's help you're going to make great prog progress proverbs 12 18 there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts but the tongue of the wise brings healing instead of trying to cut someone down tear someone apart see what you can do to encourage and build up and heal read proverbs 15 4 when you want to be negative be positive when you want to curse bless and praise god even our enemies you know, this applies to that whole politics thing I was talking about before. Luke 6, 27 and 28. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those. There's your tongue. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. I'm not saying you should be a flatterer or tell people just what they want to hear, and especially not to lie. But to the degree you can, say those good things, those positive things. Put your mouth in a positive mode. Wrapping this up. Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's a prayer that we can pray overarching this whole thing. God, it starts in my heart. Change my heart. Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable. And then, and then the words of my mouth, it'll be a whole lot easier to, to, to deal with. May the words of my mouth the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I'll tell you something, only Jesus Christ can make a difference, not only in our words, but in our hearts. We need him. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to stand. Our worship team's coming back. They're going to lead us in one song. And it's so appropriate. Lord, I need you. While this song is playing, my wife and I and Pastor Henry and Emma will be down here. We'll have masks on. If you need or want prayer for anything, it may have actually nothing to do with your tongue. You may need healing. You may need to know Jesus. We'd love to pray with you about that. We're going to do like we did last week, and that is from a distance, we will be glad to pray with you. But if you don't need extra prayer or special prayer for anything, I, I would encourage you to respond to this however you feel led 
by the Lord. You may want to sing along, make this song a prayer. If God's really laid something on your heart, you may just want to pray. You may want to kneel where you're at. If you want to come down here and kneel, you can do that. We're only going to go the length of one song because we have a fellowship to take part of. But I encourage you to take these few moments just to respond to what God has spoken to your heart today. And after this song is over, I'll come back and we'll close our time in prayer and go into our time of fellowship. But let's take a couple moments to apply what we've heard. Thank you.